got music journalist Stuart Cosgrove and Tony Wilson, who owns New Order's record label. Stuart, first of all, um, do you actually think that it is the complacency of the music press which, is, uh, which has helped Nazi chic to move into the mainstream? I think that's one of the issues. The problem with the film is that the film was uh, dealing with what's really a kind of marginal subculture with, you know, boneheads and the blood and honour scene and that. It's actually much more in the mainstream that, that worries me when I see um, people flirting with Nazi regalia or with uh, fascist symbolism. And it goes right back to 1975 with um, the famous uh, arrival of David Bowie at Victoria Station when he paraded through Victoria Station giving a, giving a Nazi salute. That classic moment where a ridiculous pop star's ego believed it was bigger than history and I think there's evidence of that right through the history of pop music um, Spear of Destiny are a, a case in point using kind of a Wagnerian image for their name which is very related to the kind of blood and honour culture that we've just uh, seen demonstrated there I think also um, people like Spandau Ballet who um, took their name and, and used really what was a kind of narcissistic ironic play on words in the history of Rudolf Hess and I think those sorts of things yes they may sound as if they're very clever clever but again it's the ego of pop stars thinking that they're actually bigger than the forces of history and they're not Iggy okay. Pop in this very town actually in 1977 story Chinese restaurant table in the middle of a large table with screaming sea car for about 10 minutes at 4 o'clock in the morning. Okay, well, Tony, since, uh, since we're on to you now, then, you've had a very long association with Joy Division and then New Order. I mean, how, yeah. do, you, how, yeah. how do you answer what Stuart's saying? What did Stuart say? I thought well, he gave us a potted history of uh, 19th century culture. What, what were you saying? Stuart, I mean, basically... I was saying that there was it very strange. strong evidence sure, 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 that... Sure. We saw up there, we saw up there, we talked about punk, right? And shock and the rest of it. And it was, I mean, I was the guy who had to persuade Jordan to take a swastika off her arm uh, in August 76 with the Pistols' first television appearance when she was there roadie. It was part of punk and seemed to me, I would not complain about that, the pure shock of it. Because if you're doing it to shock, you're saying it's a terrible thing, otherwise you wouldn't be doing it. Yeah, but Tony, one of the fallacies about that shock culture in punk is that it was believed, believed that it was attacking a kind of parent generation who may have been involved in the war and all the rest of it. You, yeah, but try telling that to somebody who's 12 year old and maybe lives, an Asian who lives in a council housing estate and is having shit shoved through the letterbox. It's those sorts of things. I'm talking about fascism sure. now in this culture and not about the shock that, you know, is the, the oh, debut well, yeah. of I mean, the I'm war. Talk, I mean, I'm going to be here because of to do with Joy Division and Joy Division I mean, it's always interesting. I mean, I always think the reason we all got that stuff was we were successful. We didn't play the media's game. It was their way of getting us. But do you I not mean, think and that Joy Division were contemporaneous with the Sex Pistols. And in your pleasant enough film there, it says, Sex Pistols, it's okay. And then the guy has a go at Joy Division. I mean, it's contemporaneous. It was part of punk culture. I have no problems with that. Right the way through to the very end of the Pistols with the two... SS guys on the barge in the Ronnie Biggs video. I enjoyed that. Do you enjoy that? Uh, well, can, I, can I just interrupt you? Uh, that's pantomime. I don't think that the oh, film yes, was yes, actually right. saying that it was defending of course it the wasn't. sex pistols the whole thing, at all. The whole, thing, the whole thing was pantomime. But all I'm saying is it comes down to the fact that there is this subgrouping of kids. Okay, I'm going to have to interrupt you for one second because I want to do it just to talk generally. We're, we're talking about music at the moment, and of course, it has actually permeated mainstream culture, hasn't it as well? Where? Uh, uh, you keep saying well, that. You keep well, I think one of the one of the strong examples of that is um, depending on how mainstream you want to go. One of the strong examples is that is that in fashion and style, and particularly in style journalism, there's certainly, uh, I think, over the last 10, 15 years, been a gradual but um, systematic glamorization of fascism, particularly in the fashion and style press. I mean. Uh, probably the most consistent letters that the face in Arena magazine get into that office are criticisms of the way in which they use photography of, of, of fascist groups. And there was a very uh, strong example very recently where they used the image of an Austrian, a 15-year-old Austrian fascist who was facing a jail sentence for beating up an immigrant. And he was uh, photographed holding guns like that in a very glamorous and stylish pose. And it almost was trying to say this person has glamour. I don't think he's glamorous at all. I think he's a crook. I think he should be in jail, and I think he's a fascist and a racist. All right, listen, thanks very much, both of you. We're going to come back to this later, actually. We've been on Nazi symbolism in youth culture. Now, first of all, I'd like to discuss the fashion aspect of fascist chic, and uh, to do that, I've got fashion designer Nicholas Giorgio. Hi. Um, Nicholas, would you actually ever entertain using any of this kind of imagery in your, your clothes? Uh, no way. There's, uh, it's too strong an image to use. It's... Uh it's uh, very frightening to know that people are using it. And um, in my clothes, I think, you know, with fashion, it should be flattering and people should, you know, be delighted in seeing what people are wearing. But 
there's anything there that's offensive, I don't think it should be there at all. OK, all right, thanks. Now, we've had uh, a lot of calls on the reaction line, so we've got some questions for Tony and Stuart. First of all, Mick Parker from Basildon for Stuart. Um, he says that he doesn't like the Nazi image of a name like Joy Division or a band like Screwdriver, but he says, what about bands like Public Enemy? Who, um, who are going on for black power? Well, I did a thing on pub Public Enemy where I attacked them politically as well, and I suppose the argument there is that um, they're supporters of Louis Farrakhan and they um, put forward what is effectively a separatist um, racial ideology. I'm not sure that Public Enemy actually fit directly into this um, category, I mean, because in lots of ways I think there's a great deal of uh, dispute within the band, actually, as to what they politically think, and they certainly are using um, po politics confrontationally. Uh, the main difference between them is Public Enemy is music that um, is power that you can dance to. Screwdriver tends to be things that you'd want to dance on, and I just you know, don't <laughs> see them as anything. Okay. Um, Tony, Peter Hagen from... It's also the difference between being an underdog racist and an overdog racist, which makes it morally different. Sorry. All okay. right. Okay, Peter Hagen from Scotland um, says, if you um, know that the name New Order has fascist overtones and offends people, then why continue to use it? Well, it was taken. It has Khmer Rouge overturns, and I'm willing to get into a discussion about the merits of Pol Pot with anybody. But if one knows it offends people, that would not worry one as one little bit. My mother taught me very early on never to worry what people think. And offending people is something I've enjoyed throughout the years. I mean, the only concern I would ever have. I mean, Julie Birch in '81 said there is a danger about factory silence. I took that seriously, and one I kind of monitored it, and I would be upset if at any in the thousands of Joy Division and New Order fans that I've met at concerts around the world, if even one of them had said, oh, you know, I, I read Mein Camp recently after reading your group, I'd have been terrified. But as long as, and as we expected and knew, there was no influence at all, that it was like the Sex Pistols thing, it was part of punk, and had no relationship, it doesn't worry me. And offending people, you know, I'd be trying to offend Stuart all night, and there's nowhere near. <laughs> nowhere, right? not, not happen. Um, but do you not think, though, that by using those kind of names, it actually contributes to a general... Um, no. No, I don't. I don't think so at all. I think it's a, uh, a, a bullshit concept. I think that basically there is a substrata, normally working class youth, I'm sure there's some fascist upper class youth, they've been around, they attach themselves to Jimmy Percy, they attach themselves to Madness, Oi, now they're with this screwdriver lot. I mean, I mean, the one thing I'd like to mention in, in relation to this is that the great culture of the last year, the acid house culture, which is very much a, a football terrace, working class culture, has not one overtone of this fascism, which probably proves that fascists can't dance. All right, Tony, thanks. Um, another question for Stuart. Um, Gary Elms from Reading says that he agrees with, um, in fact, banning fascist memorabilia, but what about extreme left-wing material, which is just uh, as likely to offend somebody? Oh, I think it's um, definitely likely to offend. The question really isn't to do with whether something's offensive or not offensive. The difference is to do is whether something is racially intimidatory. Uh, and the Race Relations Act are about whether something incites racial hatred. And there's no way that a hammer and sickle incites racial hatred. It might incite people to politically disagree with it, but that's a quite different issue. So I think that to compare the swastika with a hammer and sickle or to compare the politics of the right with the politics of the left in, in those respects is completely ridiculous. Okay. That's cause, that's cause we're All right, hold on. Thanks very much. We want to discuss the legal aspects of this, and we've got uh, lawyer Rhys Vaughan with us. Now, are there any circumstances, Rhys, under which you could actually be prosecuted for wearing a swastika T-shirt? No, not at all. That's one of the anomalies of the law. I mean, you can be prosecuted for um, distributing or publishing um, um, literature which has swastikas, which is, uh, incites people to racial hatred. But to just wear a T-shirt in the streets is not an offence. Whether it should be is another matter.